Well, this is great. I'm really happy to see everybody here tonight. Um, and uh, good evening to everybody. It's so great to see you here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for another Brockton Library first Thursday suffrage centenny, centennial conversation event. And uh, we started back in March at some point. And from now until the fall, we'll have many esteemed scholars, and I see one who just joined us, Willie Wilson, mm -hmm. um, facilitating conversations about the women's suffrage movement otherwise known as the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. A decades-long fight ratified in 1920 that allowed women the right to vote in elections and to run for office. Um, I'll introduce tonight's event, and that's what it is, in a moment, but want to let you know that in two weeks on Wednesday, August 19th at 6.30, uh, we'll have our movie night, um, Reclaiming Their Voice, the Native American Vote in New Mexico and Beyond. And the movie follows Native Americans in New Mexico taking a stand against injustice in the political process. And then uh, the following week on Wednesday, August 26th, again at 6.30, um, we'll be having the impact of cyber attacks and civ civic engagement. And along with our uh, own Brockton Mayor Robert Sullivan, uh, we'll also be having um, Stephanie Helm, who's the Mass Cyber Center Director. And I think we'll have a few other people participating in the conversation as well. Um, for up-to-date information, please visit our Facebook page. And I know that Jen's gonna put that into the chat box in a few minutes. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank our Library Director, Paul Engel and Board of Trustees for their support of this project. And especially like to thank our sponsors who have provided all the funding for um, this whole series of events we've been having starting in January and running now through um, sometime in November. And that's the Barbara Lee Foundation and Mass Humanities. I personally like to thank the Library Suffrage Planning Committee. And I think all but one member is here. Um, which is fantastic, um, who continues to do a phenomenal job with keeping this project alive and well. And a super special thank you tonight to uh, uh, Brockton Community Access because they're here tonight and they're broadcasting this live tonight and we'll have it up on their YouTube channel um, probably in pretty short order. Um, we'll be especially interested to hearing your feedback about how tonight's conversation went. Um, Jen will put a link in the chat box in a little while to a brief, it is a brief online survey provided by Mass Humanities and uh, them and us would like to know what you thought of tonight's program. Um, I know those of you who typically attend our events love to know the story behind the story. Um, so that's what we're doing tonight. Um, we really do not have one presenter tonight, but a conversation with several people for what has been a nearly year long collaboration between um, several folks to create the short film you're about to see to reenact the suffrage meeting at the Ames Mansion in Easton more than 100 years ago in 1915. We'll follow the film with a discussion like we typically do to include uh, several people involved with the production, the uh, visitor services supervisor at the mansion, as well as the script writer and producers of the film to honor the contributions of Blanche Ames to the women's suffrage movement. One of the masterminds of the project is Olivia Pierce. She's smiling up there who just graduated from Oliver Ames High School in Easton. And we're thrilled to know that she has accepted a full scholarship to the University of Texas at Austin. And it's just been such an incredible, there you go, look at all the applause. Such an incredible um, time that we've spent with her. Um, it's just been absolutely incredible. Um, and Olivia was the film's script writer and director, and she's gonna introduce what we're about to watch. So without further ado, live from the safe distance of her own home, I'd like to introduce Olivia Pierce. Hi everyone. So um, the film that, as Pat said, we've been working on for over a year, and what you're about to see is a reenactment of a suffrage meeting that happened in, um, 1915 and it happened in the Ames mansion in Borderland. Um, Blanche Ames, who you'll learn about in the film, um, 
was a suffragist as well as an inventor and an artist. Um, she was a Renaissance, Renaissance woman. Um, and she hosted a suffrage meeting to strategize and plan um, to get the vote for women in, um, but the meeting was foiled, as you'll learn in our film, by a blizzard. So she thought that no one was going to show up. Um, the conditions were horrible. And obviously this is 1915, there's no um, like snow tires or anything. So these women were walking. Um, she thought no one would show up and lo and behold, women actually did show up. Um, to meet and strategize because the vote was just that important that even a blizzard could not stop these women from um, strategizing and planning to get themselves the right that the, to vote that they deserved. So I think that's all my introduction and I think we can roll the film now. November 2nd, 1915, Blanche and other like-minded women, they knew that the question of suffrage was gonna become a ballot question. Blanche wanted to start off 1915 correctly. She wanted to gather all the local like-minded women together in one place to plot, to plan, to strategize, to ensure that they would get the yes vote on November 2nd, 1915. So Blanche and all of her wisdom, and she decides to hold a suffragette meeting here at Borderland on January 13th, 1915. She'd set up the library here at Borderland with all the chairs, moved all the tables in there. But January 13th, Blanche, she wakes up here at Borderland. She looks outside and over a foot of snow had fallen. It had become the snowiest day on record and she feels defeated, thinking nobody in their right mind is gonna come out to a suffrage meeting. Later that day, she looks out the windows again in the distance, she starts to see women trudging through the snow, foot deep snow, and it's 1915. There are no automobiles traveling in deep snow. There are no plows plowing the roads like we have today. But on January 13th, 1915, 38 women, they braved the weather, they braved the snow. They came to Borderland. They listened to Blanche speak, all for the cause of equality, for that right to vote for suffrage. Thank you all for coming here on such a snowy day. 36 of you have trudged through feet of snow from Brockton, Whitman, Boston, Norwood, and here in Easton. The road to suffrage has been long and rocky, just like the land around us. And I'm sure the fight is far from over. 37 years ago, the first suffragists proposed their plans to Congress. 16 years ago, I looked President McKinley in the eyes and called for suffrage. For 18 long years, I have been working towards this very moment, a vote for the new amendment to guarantee the right to vote for us and our daughters. Soon, the men of Massachusetts will have a choice to make. It is our duty to women across Massachusetts and across the nation to convince them to vote for suffrage. We have gathered here today to strategize and plan how we can galvanize these men to action. This is an issue that all women must solve together, regardless of age, class, or education. The time is right for suffrage. Here in Massachusetts, we are already seeing a push towards allowing women to vote in state elections. My own husband's family has been in favor of suffrage for many years, bringing their views into the Massachusetts political sphere. Many states have already passed laws allowing women to vote, and our time is dawning. So join me today in taking the first steps to full equality and also in welcoming Ms. Park. I agree wholeheartedly with Blanche. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Maud Wood Park. Ladies and enlightened gentlemen, a vote is approaching in November. Men in four states, including Massachusetts, will go to the polls and decide whether to extend the vote to women. Now remember, of course, no woman is allowed to vote in this election. Women in the Western states have had the right to vote for years. Think of Winona Pinkham, who moved from Colorado, where she had the right to vote, to Massachusetts, where she does not have the simple right. This nonsense must end. Now, I know there are many women of privilege in this room. In fact, our hostess, Blanche, has been blessed with a beautiful home, a loving husband, Oaks, and four precious children. She wants for nothing. 
But even our dear Mrs. Ames understands that just because her life is easy, others are not as fortunate, and their lives will never change so long as they, and we, are denied the basic right to choose our leaders at the ballot box. I will use an analogy that reminds me of the anti-suffragists. They act like someone who, after enjoying a good breakfast, was approached by a hungry person. Rather than figuring out how to get that one person food, the well-fed person said, well, I've had all the food I need. In other words, although some enjoy the rights they need and are well taken care of, we must look more broadly and think about those whose needs aren't met. And how will we change this? We must convince our husbands, our brothers, our fathers, our sons, and our neighbors to vote in November, to give us what they have and have had since the founding of our great country. I often reflect on the model Susan B. Anthony provides us. Through her, it is clear that the path to suffrage is never easy. Enduring criticisms from countless men, as well as other women, she kept her head high, pushing for a cause she knew to be right, even at a time it was greatly unpopular. And look how far we've come since then. In Australia and New Zealand, women have gained the right to vote. And in the last election, of the 89% of women on the voting list, 84% showed up to vote. Think of what we would look like in the US, how our government would change if 84% of women voted. Even here in our country, the suffragists have made advancements far beyond Miss Anthony ever believed possible. If you will all direct your attention to the map next to me for a moment. This map shows which states have partial rights to vote, which have full, and which have none. The progress of our movement is shown here in red, white, and blue. As for yesterday's vote in the House of Representatives, the vote on whether to add an amendment to allow women the right to vote, Despite the House voting 204 to 174 to reject the amendment, I see it as a gain for suffragists, not a loss. The fact that a vote was held at all is a gain, as it shows progress, regardless of the vote's result. In summation, may I suggest a truth that is self-evident to me. All men and women are created equal and entitled to the same right to vote. Thank you so much, Maud. I would like to now open the floor for both questions for Ms. Park as well as discussion on how we can improve our advocacy. Ms. Brown? All across the country, women have begun marching for suffrage. We too need to join in these demonstrations and continue to march in the streets for suffrage. How can the men ignore us if we are in every corner? Although you make a good point, we've been marching for decades and they continue to ignore us. Perhaps we have to emulate the Founding Fathers and utilize the freedom of the press to our advantage. I hear talk of some women in Beverly, Massachusetts, who have the idea to publish a whole newspaper dedicated to women's suffrage. Maude has obviously been publishing her work, but perhaps we need to think bigger. I would argue that we have not been completely ignored. In fact, support for our cause is growing rapidly. Look at the South where support for suffrage has skyrocketed because of industrialization and the problem it has brought. Women are being faced with problems only the ballot can solve. Working women have become the cornerstone of suffrage, and through their marches and demonstrations, many states have implemented suffrage laws for local elections. We cannot discount these victories marching has brought us. In regards to your point about Southern women and their struggle with industrialization, I would like to point out that as industrial conditions differ in each state, so too should laws. This is why having the right to vote locally as well as nationally, is so vital for women, as they must be able to vote for state laws that can improve their lives directly. Now, while I agree that marching is highly effective, it's high time we try something new and different. We need to remember that the very first National Women's Suffrage Convention was held just a few miles away in Worcester. We have an obligation to those women, Sojourner Truth, Lucy Stone, and others. We need to do something different because we've been using the same tactics for decades with only minor victories. Keep in mind, it is not just the men we need to convince. The Massachusetts Anti-Suffrage League is full of women who are against the suffrage movement. We need to reach out and enfranchise these women. And beyond just these women who are outwardly against suffrage, there's a large percentage of women who simply do not care about the vote. The last time a vote was taken to gauge public perception about women's suffrage, only 4% of women even voted, despite being allowed to. 
You make a good point about the Anti-Suffrage League. My own cousin is a staunch supporter of Anti-Suffrage, and it is hard to deny the fact that their league is effectively organized. Perhaps we ought to follow their example. They publish pamphlets, newspapers, organize effective publicity campaigns, and host speakers. So we know we need to increase our publications, our newspapers, and our pamphlets. And we know we need to target more women with our message. For me, this seems like a simple fix. We need to publish targeted materials for other women, whether they be indifferent or opposed. We are lucky to have such talents around us, from Maud's powerful words to Blanche's political cartoons and illustrations. Together, I don't doubt our ability to make engaging and persuasive publications. Miss Park, I'm curious why you think so many friends of the Antis claim that women will lose their influence with men if they win the right to vote. <laughs> this argument is a favorite of mine. I believe that men should be the hunters and women should be sought. Well, it is said that women can lobby legislators for laws to be passed. I have been on many legislative boards and have never yet appeared before a legislator without being made to feel he was doing me a favor in listening to me, that it was a case of anything to please the ladies. If a legislator appeared before a women's club to explain his intentions regarding legislative acts, we would think the skies were about to fall. The ability to elect legislators who will push for our causes rather than try to push legislators who disagree with us to support our causes is vital. We need to communicate this idea to the antis. And what should we say to those antis who claim a woman cannot be both a homemaker and a suffragist? To that argument, I would say, look around you. Today, my own children, Evelyn and Amos, sit among you, listening intently to every word you say. Among us, there are suffragists who are also homemakers. The two are not mutually exclusive. What should we say to the argument that ignorant women should not vote? Many argue that most women are not informed enough to vote. To that, I would argue that many ignorant men vote every election, and yet the democracy survives. Second, it is the unignorant women who need the right to vote. We must focus on the majority of women who are not ignorant and would be perfectly capable voters. I'm interested in everyone's thoughts on the recent protests by the National Women's Trade Union. For those of you who may not have heard, the union has released resolutions against the rich, privileged women who have banded together to form anti-suffrage leagues. The union says that these rich women do not have to vote if they do not want to, but they should not actively work to deprive other women of the ballot. It is no secret that we who gather here today are wealthy as well, as wealthy as those women who the union is protesting against. Ladies, do we realize these resolutions were passed at a national convention of what is the largest organized body of working women in the world? Do we realize these women are passing resolutions against us? That we, in our sheltered homes, if we are engaged in work for the anti-movement, are working against the advancement of these working women? Do we realize that while our wealth may make it possible for us to move away from places where city ordinances are not enforced, there are hundreds of poor women who must remain in these environments? Do we realize that while we may, with our money, secure pure milk for our children, there are hundreds of poor mothers who need the ballot in order to secure for their children the legislation and enforcement of such legislation in order that they may secure good milk for their children? Here, here. Perhaps we are at an advantage then in reaching these wealthy antis. After all, they know nothing of the struggles of ordinary women and thus would be unable to relate to their arguments. But they do occupy the same social spheres as we do. Perhaps that is our job, to speak to these women, to show them how we have a duty to the working women who need the ballot in order to advocate for their causes and aid their struggles. I heartily concur. I urge you all to keep in mind that these are the difficulties that beset every generation where some of the progressive people seek a way to move forward. It has been the attitudes of certain people in every generation to try and hold back, to refrain from whatever is new. We are engaged in a struggle that has been ongoing since the beginning of history. The women's movement has always existed and has not been simply focused on making women recognized as citizens, but as people. Now, I do hate to break the planning session, as so many wonderful ideas are being shared. 
but luncheon is ready up in the parlor, and I don't know about you, but I tend to think better on a full stomach. behind this reenactment was really Catherine Honey. She is in charge of the STEM network in this part of Massachusetts, and she really wanted to help celebrate 2020 being 100 years of celebration of women's suffrage. So she approached me and we started a working group um, with many amazing organizations locally. And on the first couple uh, meetings that we had, we had this awesome round table discussion. That's when we started planning um, let's reenact the January 13th meeting that Blanche held here. I give um, a lot of recognition to the Brockton Public Library as well as Oliver Ames High School under Olivia Pierce. I began sort of brainstorming with the script by um, doing a lot of research on the women's suffrage mo movement in Massachusetts and sort of when this meeting took place in the context of other events in women's suffrage history. I then started brainstorming how I wanted the meeting itself to go, um, how I thought Blanche might have run at such a meeting like this. Um, I was able to, thanks to the Brockton Public Library, get access to newspaper articles um, about the event that were written right after it. I was able to find two articles, one from the Enterprise and one from the Brockton Times. And so we were able to get a list of those who attended the meeting. A lot of women from Brockton and Easton, women, I believe, um, and of course, Blanche. So I um, based everything solely off of that. So as much of um, real historical quotes that I could pull from those newspaper documents, I did. Um, and then where I didn't really know what they said or what was being done at that time, I sort of used my imagination to think, well, what would I have done? Or what would um, people that I know ho would have done in these situations and what would have been said? Um, I had help from children's author Kate Kleiss in editing and making sure that things flowed and the story it made sense. Um, and then Ed Hands of the Eastern Historical Society helped me make sure that all of my historical facts were correct. We actually had table read where I was able to make more changes, mostly, you know, small grammatical things, lines that didn't quite make sense and didn't quite feel like something that would have been said. And then from there, I sort of uh, refined into a final script. Blanche Ames was just an amazing woman who had many different talents. She was known to be an artist and an inventor, um, and she also worked very hard for women's rights. I think there are so many women, like Blanche, whose efforts have been lost to history, and I hope that other people will be aware uh, that she's only one of many women who put their lives on the line many times to get, grant us, to give us this right to vote. So it's really interesting and important to know that it, uh, it takes all of us to get things done and not just to sit back and wait for other people to do it. We have to get involved and have your say. I mean, that's what democracy is all about. Um, I'm hoping that the students who will come there will also learn about her name and that they might be inspired to research her, find out about her inventions, that they might realize that it's something that you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You can just be an ordinary girl who likes orchids or likes to play with things and build things and make things and that, you know, maybe that will inspire them to study something and per pursue a career in STEM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, quite a big um, show of support and big hand out to um, Olivia in particular. Um, she wrote the script for this and directed it. 
I can tell you firsthand, she had me do, what was it, nine takes, I think, <laughs> of the first line, which for some reason I thought I knew that walking in. It was the second line I thought I was concerned about. And then all of a sudden I realized, no, I just don't have a handle on that first line. So it's like, okay, Pat, let's take it again. <laughs> so thank you, Olivia. Um, I think I'm on a... Um, hand it off to Olivia right now to just, you know, let's start with the question. Why is it that you got involved with this project? So I've been involved with Catherine's um, STEM committees for a while, for a couple of years. And um, she emailed me and told me that she was doing this other project um, and that I should come to the meeting. And I came to the meeting and, you know, as often happens when I show up to meetings, I am very eager to do anything and as such I often get voluntold to do stuff so I kind of wound up uh writing this writing this script um I grew up attending a lot of historical reenactments at the Adams homestead um so I kind of had that basis and I was really um excited to bring one to this town so that was sort of how I got involved in the project through my involvement in the STEM work in the STEM network and through um Catherine Um, great. Uh, Paul, let's uh, turn to you. This is Paul Clifford. He's the, uh, let me see if I've got your title right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. You're the Director of Visitor Services for uh, the Borland State, Park, yeah. Borland State Park. Great. Um, so, you know, we, uh, it's no surprise to me that um, you decided to get involved this year because of the 100th uh, anniversary of the women's right to vote. Um, how is it that I, you know, I know you explained a little bit in the film, but how is it that um, uh, you decided to really figure out this reenactment, which is, I remember being from the very, almost the very first couple of meetings. Um, how is it that uh, you really decided to get involved? Um, like I said in the video, Catherine Honey from the STEM Network, she was the impetus behind this whole, this whole project. She approached me, she knew, she knew Blanche's history, and it was just a great fit between keeping Blanche's name and legacy alive. That's my job, to tell the story of Blanche here at Borderland State Park. And one of the best ways to do it is to work with the community. And that's what Catherine brought to me, the community the amazing people at the Brockton Public Library or um, like Suzanne Bump from the um, Troubletown District, Circle District and Olivia P.S. It was such a great working group that we were able to brainstorm. We had a lot more ideas than actually came through and I really wish that COVID never came and I wish that we were able to do this live because just being inside the Ames Mansion and actually seeing this come to life, I think would have, created a whole nother level of appre appreciation for Oaks and Blanche, mostly Blanche. Yeah, I, I remember some of those early meetings where, um, you know, the conversation was about doing this live, what was it, once an hour for like five hours? We went back and forth many times, like, did we want to do it once on the hour, every half an hour, every 15 minutes? Um, I think we were going to end up doing it every half an hour. So it would have been a really long day, but I think the reward would have been all the visitors, all the people leaving that reenactment, understanding more about Blanche, having that firsthand experience. And like I said, this working group was so amazing. Um, and I really hope that maybe in the future we can bring this to life as long as Olivia will allow us to use her beautiful script. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of curious, you know, we know very little about Blanche Ames Ames. Um, why don't you think that Blanche received credit for all the things she's accomplished? I think if she was a man, she would. She was mm -hmm. a woman. Um, and my, like I said, my job is to bring Blanche's history to life. I give tours of the Ames Mansion when there's no COVID. I try to do five, six tours a week inside the Ames Mansion. Um, but if she was a man, I'm pretty sure there'd be a lot more books. There'd be a lot more uh, name recognition um, than she has today. But with films like this and the beautiful documentary that Kate and um, Kevin Friend did, 
um, a few months ago, uh, we together as a community, we are keeping her legacy alive. And I encourage everybody who's watching this to come to Borderland to learn something more about Blanche to Google her. Um, because we don't want to lose women like Blanche to history. Women all over America, all over the world, they might be on the name recognition level of Susan B. Anthony or Michelle Obama. And then there's other people like Blanche who are more local heroes. And the local heroes are the ones we need, we need to recognize and we need to celebrate. A couple of things I want to jump in and mention, and that is that Kevin Friend is in fact going to be with us the end of September. Um, we're going to be showing his movie, um, and we'll be having a conversation with him after that. And I think it's September 23rd off the top of my head. Um, and then I lost my other thought completely, but that's what happens sometimes. Um, you know, I'd like to also turn the, I'd like to turn the conversation right now to um, Ezra and to Laura, um, Laura um, Liebert and Ezra Werb, uh, who produced the film. And why is it that you decided to get involved? Where did that come from? So we had just moved from Los Angeles to Brockton. Uh, this is now last May, June. And uh, I grew up here. I grew up in Brockton, going as a kid to Borderland with my parents taking us and playing in the fields. And I never knew anything up until last May about Blanche or the Ames family at all. Um, and then we, so of course we went back to Borderland when we got here to explore that magical place. And we saw the opportunity to take one of Paul's mansion tours, uh, not knowing Paul yet. And we went in and met him and he gave us his tour and we were just really taken with his story. And one of our first thoughts was, have you ever, delivered that story on camera. So, you know, the, you just saw that come to fruition. And then we found out about the planning committee and the kind of reenactment plans. And he also told us about the, the comprehensive full documentary that was being made. Um, but we felt we could contribute by talking to committee members and Paul and Olivia and, you know, making sure to get the people involved uh, on camera to be um, solidify and have have their um, this this legacy that they're continuing through this hundred years uh, on camera. Yeah, and uh, personally, I um, when I heard Blanche's story from Paul, I I'm a novelist, and I I'm nowhere near even getting started on this novel, but I, I, I mean this biography. But I wanted to connect Emma Goldman. Ida B. Wells, and I was like, but there should be a third person, I don't know. And, and then when I heard about Blanche, I was like, oh, this will all fit together, because they're around the same time period, and they all come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, they all have different ethnicities, but they all connect in this idea of equality. So um, uh, for those who don't know uh, Ida B. Wells or uh, Emma Goldman, you you probably do. <laughs> um, they're, you know, they are, you know, big names in the history of women and women's suffrage and inequality. Um, but Blanche, um, a woman of privilege, uh, is kind of, you know, what she does and her contribution in this kind of um, methodical uh, year after year commitment to to suffrage, I think, is important. And I think that for me, the most important thing is what several people say in the documentary, which is really uh, democracy is not a spectator sport and we all have to get involved. We all have the obligation to do what we can to make uh, our world a better world, a more just world. And that is as relevant today as it was then. Thanks, Laura. Um, Paul, if I could go back to you for a second. Um, do you have the names of the suffragists who did show up uh, at the, the uh, mansion that day? And um, did any of them become famous? That's a great question. Um, and first off, I just want to thank Laura and Ezra for the amazing documentary that you guys put together. It was amazing. Um, Yes, I do have the list of all the women who attended that meeting. Had you asked me this question one year ago, I would have said no. But it's because of the due diligence of um, 
everybody at the Brockton Public Library. I believe Paul was the one who unearthed the, um, the article. And in the article, it lists all, I believe, 38 women who attended that meeting. Um, unfortunately, I have not had time to really research each of those women. Um, I can only assume that somebody went on to do something great. I can tell you Blanche did. Blanche went on and she made, she joined the birth control uh, movement of Massachusetts. She invented things for World War II. Um, she lived a remarkable life. But from that meeting that was just reenacted, that group of women, they go on and for the rest of 1915 and beyond, they continue to hit the pavement and they continue to fight for equality. They were, they were, I guess, my heroes, if you could put it that way. Um, I've got a few other questions, but does anybody else want to jump in? Uh, I know this isn't, most of the people who are regulars here uh, usually aren't too quiet, so um, really go ahead. Yeah, if you can unmute Willie. You won't let me unmute. Yeah. There we are, Willie. Hey, you go. Uh, first of all, uh, very good job, Olivia. Wonderful job. It's just nice. This is the first time I've seen it. And the documentary that Ezra uh, and Laura did, outstanding, superlative. Uh, now, my concern is, of course, with the uh, the connection and some of those women who were there, I believe Mrs. Uh, Kent, who was the mayor's wife from Brockton. So we are doing research, but my specific focus is on the black uh, suffragettes. Um, Edith, uh, Edith Royster, a uh, black woman here in Brockton was involved. And then, uh, uh, Laura mentioned Ida B. Wells. And um, in addition to Ida B. Wells, there was Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Mary Church Terrell, Mary Ann Shad, Adela Hunt, Fanny Jackson Coppin, uh, Helen Apple Cook, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Fanny Barrier Williams, Margaret Murray Washington, uh, Ida Clark DePriest, and Elizabeth Piper Inslee, just to name a few in terms of African American women. And, the, and unfortunately, because of, of uh, discrimination and segregation, uh, the National Women's Group uh, wouldn't allow them to participate, so they formed their own group. And, uh, but it's a rich, rich history. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that's our concern. And I, I think it goes to a point that Paul mentioned as well as Laura of the hundreds and possibly thousands of women who played a role, but whose names have not been recorded. And, uh, and so that's an important work that I'm hoping with the 100th anniversary, and that's what we've been doing as scholar for the program at the Brockton Public Library and, and some of these fantastic activities we've been doing. And, I'm, and it's really a shout out to the Brockton Public Library and those at Borderland. In spite of the pandemic, we've been able to do these unique, uh, outstanding uh, programs. And uh, as I hear from the public and colleagues, uh, they're very impressed. So a shout out to everybody. Thank you, Willie. Um, you know, one of the things uh, Willie just alluded to, and um, Willie is our lead humanities scholar on this project, um, and Amina Pilgrim, who's not visible right now, um, is also one of our humanities scholar. And uh, we've taken a lot of great information from them. One of the things that Willie is working on right now is we're going to be having interpretive signs on the outside of the library. There's going to be um, six signs that's going to be talking, um, as Willie said, you know, a lot about the black suffragists and more importantly, the local suffragists that were involved. And yes, there is going to be a panel for uh, Blanche, so don't worry about that, Paul. Um, well, Jen yeah, someone had a question. Okay. Yeah, my hand is the one that's up, yeah. so I'm not sure if I'm the one you're being uh, you're yeah. noticing. But my name is uh, Tomasita Luvier Lagans, and I'm in Austin, Texas. So um, it will be great. Um, welcome to Austin when you get here, young lady. Um, <laughs> um, my question, I have a group of women who uh, we are working on the subject of African-American suffragettes, and I am uh, curating a quilt collection. 
um, that will tell their story. So I would like to um, get in contact with uh, Mr. Willie. I don't, I, I'd like to get more information and tell him about the project that we're working on because, you know, we are working on Ida B. Wells, who is someone who is well known, but then, you know, some of the uh, Black uh, suffragettes who are not as well known, but were uh, highly uh, uh, impactful um, in their input into the, uh, the suffrage uh, movement. Sure. I, 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 yep, I, I'll connect. Uh, I'll, in fact, I'll put my information in the uh, in the chat uh, box, and you can uh, reach me uh, via phone and email. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Super. Uh, other I, questions? I had a question, and I mean, Paul could answer it all. Willie can answer it. Do we know if any of our local black suffragists were even invited to Blanche's meeting? Would they have been invited? Well, I'll, I'll take that first. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, those here in Brockton, I don't, I, I don't know if they were invited, but they, they weren't in attendance. So that's what we're researching because there are only a few prominent black women who were involved. Edith, uh, um, uh, Edith Royster, whose husband was uh, established a business here in Brockton in 1890. And, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, that's her father, but um, uh, who who was involved and who was kind of, but uh, we're still, we're researching that and I'm, I, we're still hoping to uncover uh, more, but as to my knowledge, not all the women mentioned, uh, we do have their, some of their addresses. And like I said, Mrs. Kent, who is the mayor's wife and there are, there are several people from, from Brockton, but none of them were women of color. I don't know, you, Paul, you might have some additional information, but to, to, uh, to date, as of today, because I've been, we've been working on this project since the January, and I, I did quite a bit of work today, and I haven't uncovered anything. Paul, do you know of anything? Um, I do not know if, um, who was invited to Blanche's meeting. I just know from the research that you guys did over at Brighton Public Library of who attended. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say, um, I know Blanche, uh, she was for, she wanted the right to vote for all women. Uh, and that's even more so when she joins the Birth Control League of Massachusetts. Um, in the 1930s, she resigned from the Birth Control League because of um, some political propaganda that her vice president is making against, oh, um, something that her vice president said to the Boston um, newspapers in like 1932 and Blanche had it. And she's like, every woman deserves the right to control their body. Uh, mm -hmm. So Blanche resigned from that. And I know Blanche sat on the boards of women's hospitals in the 50s and 60s. She, I know Blanche was for all women to have the right to vote back when it was, if you will, a little unpopular. Right. Um, but to my knowledge, I do not know if they, African-American women were invited or not. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if there's, there's been no finding of her actual invite of who she actually invited. The only, the only research we can find is who, is it, who attended. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Uh, to Paul's point, uh, she, from her writings and, uh, and some of the letters, Paul, you're familiar with this, uh, in her cartoon, she she had always stated in terms of uh, 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 she spoke to the fact that uh, all women are uh, are deserving of equality, and she and she specifically does mention um, colored women, uh, Negro women, um, having the right to um, uh, to uh, have the to participate in government and so forth. So there are mentioning. So her tone uh, is there, and if you look at some of those wonderful. Uh, political cartoons that she did. Uh, they speak to that in terms of an e egalitarian and, and, uh, e and equal society for all participants. You should come and take my job. You're amazing. You know about Blanche. Um, oh, no. Listen, well, I have, to, I have to tell you, Paul, uh, my aunt and uncle worked for Eloise Ames Parker. 
at 23 Main Street. So we we have a, 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 a connection, the family has a connection to the, the family. So Blanche Ames, as a historian, and Professor Keneally is a colleague and friend of mine, as well as Ed Hands. Ed Hands was the, uh, and, uh, and so we go, there's a connection there, right? You know, I, I love the town of Eastern and we have a connection, historical connection. And, uh, in fact, Olivia, I don't know if you remember, but I used to sub uh, after I retired from as department head at Brockton High. I would sub at uh, Oliver Ames. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it is a small world. Um, I'm sure there's other questions. This, this is not a quiet group. <laughs> Lynn, what's your take on this? You were actually one of the participants in the video that you and I really didn't want to take a look at. <laughs> Laura and I, Laura and Ezra did a fantastic job because I'll tell you when I went in August or whenever, I don't remember now when I was sweating and I was didn't want to do it. And then the same thing with Olivia when I was there that day, it was July 18th and it was 100 degrees and I thought, how are we going to pull this off? So Laura and Ezra, you guys did a fantastic job. I mean, we had to sit there practice nodding and clapping and then somehow they pieced it all together. It was quite amazing. Um, and I'm just glad because I really knew nothing about Blanche James a year ago. I can't remember when I first joined Catherine's meetings. I mean, I've been working with Catherine on many other projects and I've just I've been fascinated by her and I've been telling everybody I know about her. Um, I brought a group of people from an organization, an educational group called Delta Kappa Gamma. We took a tour. Paul gave the most amazing tour. People still talk about it um, and we did that back in September and um, so I'd highly recommend going and taking the tour and I hope that um, I think Rock, um, Eastern rather is thinking about naming or has already decided to name a school after Blanche. So that's great. I mean, anything we can do to talk about women in STEM and, you know, black women, white women, whatever color women, you know, we can, I think is great. And to get girls involved in STEM is my big thing. And Lauren Ezra, I will get back to you on the email you sent me earlier about your other projects you're working on. <laughs> I've just been swamped this summer, um, but that was also fantastic. Um, so, you know, I'm just glad that the group could finally pull it off. I really didn't know how we were going to do it because um, we have been working on it for a while and when COVID hit it was just like I think we were all just like devastated like what like we had this great day planned for April 11th and you know it's just and then we were like okay July 18th and then thanks to Olivia and her friends and the others that were in the video you know we pulled it off and I'm just so glad we did and um, I'm looking forward if there's any way I don't know to share it with some of the other groups that I'm part of because um, I had invited a bunch of people to come tonight and I don't think they were able to so down the road, maybe we can figure out a way to show it to some other groups as well and keep spreading the word. So thank you to everybody that was part of it. I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. <laughs> I didn't want to see you myself in video. I remember when Lynn was interviewed, she was like, I, I'm terrible on camera. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, Olivia is going, um, I mean, Olivia, you, is it okay to say what you're planning on studying? At, you tell them. <laughs> oh, well, I'm studying engineering, so definitely not directing. I um, apologize to everyone. That was my first foray into the world of film directing. Originally, when I signed on, this is going to be theatrical, something like a live theater piece, which is something I have a lot more experience in. So when we had to transfer it to film, I, you know, it wasn't something that I was familiar or comfortable with. So I guess I had to, you know, be like Blanche James and adapt and learn something new. Um, I, do, I don't think I'm I'm the next Ryan Johnson, you know, who's someone who directed there before me. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it was it was an interesting interesting experience. But yes, I'm studying engineering. Well, good for you. You're yeah. you're taking yeah. after Blanche. Exactly. That was, <laughs> my, that was my thing. It was like yay. Yeah, exactly. Um, other questions or comments, sir? You know, we all do owe a debt of gratitude to Catherine Honey um, because she got me involved in this project as well, too. Um, I don't know how many. You, why don't you raise your hand if you got involved because of Catherine? <laughs> oh, my. About 50% of us. <laughs> See what you did, Catherine? <laughs> yes, we have another uh, hand raised. Go ahead. Yes, so uh, my other question, uh, again, congratulations to you, Olivia. I was uh, one of the founders of the, uh, the SWE chapter, um, Women in Engineering at University of Texas. So 
congratulations again. I'm an engineer as well. Um, I have a question for uh, Laura. Um, you mentioned uh, Ida B. Wells, I guess, in doing some documentation in um, a film maybe you have uh, forthcoming. Um, can uh, we connect as well? Uh, you did mention Ida B. Wells. Uh, I think you mentioned Mary Church Terrell. And so I wanted to see what other uh, information you possibly have about African-American suffragettes. Um, I would love to connect with you and I would love to connect with Willie, I was I was over here saying, okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking to them. Um, yeah, so my my interest um, started from my interest is in Ida B. Wells and her personal history with the suffrage movement and you know what she did with that. Um, so I would love to connect with you and see what you're you're doing and how I can help. Um, I come I was coming at it from actually a um, author background, more of a um, literary, but we, when we started coming to the committee meetings, we, we realized in this case, we, um, we thought that this was something we could bring um, our filmmaking experience to. So I would love to connect with, with you and with Willie and we can see what y'all are doing and how we can help. Um, one of the other things I'll mention is one of the first events that we ran um, was on black suffragists back in February. Um, and you can actually see that video. Um, I'm trying to think where right this second. Um, On it's, the BCA? Um, yeah, I, I believe it's the Brockton Community Access. If you go to YouTube and I will type try to in, find that link for everybody right now. Yeah, okay, okay if you can. Great. Um, yeah, that was an absolutely incredible um, evening we had. Um, four wonderful people, um, Courtney from the NAACP, Paula Austin from um, a professor at Boston University. Um, we had um, Marita Rivera, uh, who was the director and president of the uh, Black History Museum here in Boston, and um, Charlene Green, the president of the uh, Boston uh, chapter of the um, uh, da, da, da. <laughs> National Council of Negro Women. Um, and it was just an absolutely delightful conversation. I think we went for about an hour and a half, mm -hmm. but um, I, you can, you should be able to, to find that. If not, um, I'm we, looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jen. Um, if not, then, you know, you might want to go to our, our Facebook page, which um, Jen can put in the chat box in a second. It's, um, it's up in there in the chat somewhere. Um, okay. I put us up already for our Facebook page. And I also put in a link for some of Blanche's political cartoons if anybody's interested in seeing those. Yeah, I saw that. That's great. Um, yeah, Blanche's cartoons are just phenomenal. <laughs> um, um, really quickly. Uh -huh. um, I just want to give a shout out to the Friends of Borderland like them on Facebook. Um, what they did, because August is Women's Equality Month, happy Women's Equality Month. Um, they have placed, uh, they enlarged all of Blanche's political cartoons and at Borderland State Park from the visitor center all the way over to the Ames Mansion, all of those giant political cartoons are up so people can understand and see what Blanche created over a hundred years ago to get that right to vote. So like them on Facebook, we're gonna share them on Facebook, Friends of Borderland. That's, that's, that's great. Paul, I was, uh, I was giving you credit to one of the members of the Ames family because I happened to have been over there this past weekend and saw the cartoons and I attributed it to you, um, yep. rather. <laughs> so, so it I, wasn't. I did correct it, but I've got to, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna still assign credit to you. Paul, can you put the, can you put the Facebook um, page in the chat? Uh, Friends of Borderland? Yeah. Friends of Borderland, yeah. Yep, I'll get that one for you too. I oh, just cool, put the you. YouTube link for everybody. Um, so I'll get the Borderland Friends link too. And then I'm also going to throw in the survey. So if you have to, I know a bunch of people are popping off. So if they could fill that out for the Mass Humanities, um, that'd be greatly appreciated. So I'll pop that in the chat too. If people could do that if they need to pop off. I just want to take an opportunity to say hello to Evelyn DeLudis. 
from the uh, uh, the book society. Um, uh, you know, we've done some projects, uh, outstanding projects, and also Anne Hanyadi. I see she's in there. She just recently retired from the Brockton Public Schools. It's always nice to see her. But uh, the uh, the wonderful people like this this uh, lady from Texas and. You know, the, the number of people who participate, we're always, uh, you know, it's just great. And uh, and our hope is, you know, with this project, you know, we're going to have some permanent installations and so forth, but uh, that we never allow that fervor and that uh, excitement and energy to dissipate as we go into this, uh, this next voting season and the importance of women, uh, uh, not just to voting, but to our society. And, had it not been for, uh, you know, uh, sexual discrimination, you know, that we would be, as a nation, even more advanced. So we want it, we want, that's what we're teaching the students. Gregory, Gregory Hazelwood couldn't be here uh, this evening. He's another partner in our, in our group and teaches at Brockton High, uh, African American history, but uh, very good, very good. Does anybody that hasn't said anything have any um, comments or questions? I haven't said anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to do a, a little shout out for my granddaughter. Her name is Akira Harper, and she just completed a master's and starts her PhD in STEM in September. Oh. So she's been going through a master's PhD program. So it's it's broader than you think, and it's closer to home, you know, <laughs> than you think. It's the program's really working, and she's been traveling around. She's gone to a couple, uh, maybe three different countries, and traveled around the United States speaking on behalf of STEM. Oh, wow. So, where, where is she based out of? Um, Natick. I live in Natick. Really? And her okay. mother, you know, her family, they're all here. And you can have her speak that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I run the Act So program for the, uh, in addition to running the makerspace at the library, the Brockton mm -hmm. Library, I also run the um, Act So program for the Brockton NAACP. Um, and that's a program where we mentor high school students and then they uh, compete locally and the top gold winners in each of the 32 categories, it's more than STEM, but I work specifically with the STEM students, go on to national competition. And we actually have three students going next week to national competition virtually. Awesome. Um, and uh, two of them are in STEM. And it's just been a pleasure working with them and getting them to um, get ready for the competition, which mm -hmm. has not been easy because it's been the date has been changed three times already so <laughs> but i think i would love to talk to your daughter and get her involved in our our uh, act so program absolutely that'd be great okay i'll pass along your information and uh, and i'll give you her information okay that's great other questions so paul i guess i'm curious um you know we know what happened during the meeting in 1915 but what happened as a result of that meeting what was the you know, the next thing that happened out of that. Do you know? Yeah, great question. So Blanche and that group of women um, from that meeting until the election day, November 2nd, um, Blanche puts on or attends 49 events throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. One day in October, because as November 2nd is approaching, Blanche, she goes to more and more events and she does more and more. One day in October, Blanche wakes up here at Borderland early in the morning. She drives herself, Oaks and Blanche, they had a chauffeur, but Blanche, she drives herself to Worcester, Massachusetts, where she jumps on a train, takes the train out to Springfield, Massachusetts. She marches in a parade. Then she takes the train back to Worcester. Then she marches in another parade in Worcester and meets local politicians. And then she drives herself back to Borderland that night gets in a little around midnight. So all in one day, she traveled from one side of the state to the other for equality at a time when the highways are not like the highways we have today. Um, and then November 2nd happens. The men of Massachusetts, because the men, they were the only ones allowed to vote. They go to the polls and they vote. They vote no. There was something like 66% of Massachusetts men said no to women's equality. When Blanche found that news out, 
she vowed to herself that she would ring the giant bell that now sits on top of the mansion. She vowed to ring that bell every single day at noon until women, not just here in Massachusetts, but women from sea to shining sea got that equality. And every day at noon, that bell rang. And the people of Easton and Sharon and Mansfield and Brockton, they heard that bell. And they understood that, they understood that symbolism that Blanche was ringing it for. And it wasn't until August 26th, 1920, the day that Wilson, President Wilson signed into law the 19th Amendment, the woman in Massachusetts got that equality. Wow. Okay, other questions, other, you're all, you're all quiet tonight. What's going on here? <laughs> I, I just want, I want to mention that, uh, you know, she was a firestorm and she continued that and then she went on to her next project, which was birth control. Um, and unfortunately, what, what people here uh, in Massachusetts don't realize that uh, there were millions of people who couldn't vote. So even though the, the 20th Amendment was passed, those in the Jim Crow South, uh, men couldn't vote because of, of the Black Codes, Jim Crow uh, laws. And then also the women couldn't, even though the law was passed, they couldn't participate. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's regional in terms of its effectiveness. And Colorado, which was the second uh, state to give women the right to vote, we have in all the states where the right to vote was uh, activated, we have black suffragists who were uh, participating and pushing. And uh, it is alluded to uh, some of those people from Colorado, actually white, I, I don't know about black ones, but white ones did come to Massachusetts to help because as you know, some of the Western states, the women already had the right to vote. But uh, she was a phenomenal person. Uh, those of you who haven't been to Borderland or had a tour, uh, it is just a unbelievable, unbelievable place. And uh, even if you've had a tour, it's good to every uh, couple of years to, to do it again. And uh, one of the friends to Borderland, a good friend of mine, uh, Harvey and Estelle Bachman, um, they just, they just love the place. Uh, they were Brocktonians who moved to Easton and, uh, and, and just couldn't rave enough about it. Yeah. So Paul, I guess I have to ask, I mean, what kind of an archivist was Blanche? I mean, did she leave behind a lot of papers for research purposes? That's a great question. Um, yes and no. Blanche was very creative in life. She was an artist, so she was constantly just doing the next thing or inventing the next thing. She had a diary and she did have a lot of like letters and notes that she kept. Today, you can find them at the Sophia Smith um, um, archives at Smith College. Hmm. However, there was Oakes, her husband, the scientific mind. He kept a daily diary. And in his daily diary, he would document almost every single day of their life. Um, and I have Oakes' diary right now from Wednesday, January 13th, 1915, the day that Blanche held that meeting. And in Oakes' diary, he writes, a heavy snow driven by high winds. I never heard the winds blow with such violence as it did last night. The fields were white with snow and Blanche began final preparations. I surely felt hopeless roused within me. Fully 40 people were present at the suffrage meeting, which was held in the library at about 2.45. At lunch, we thought it would be indeed remarkable if 20 people came after a storm, which the papers say it was the worst in the records of the Weather Bureau. So we have a lot of history because of Oaks, but Blanche, a lot of her history is at Smith, um, Smith College. And if you love Blanche or you love Oaks, reach out to me or please reach out to Smith College to uncover some more of her diaries. Wow. That's amazing. Mm. And a question. Um, in, so in the film, um, Maude Wood Park seemed to be the keynote speaker. Who is she? Um, why was she the, the keynote speaker, so to speak? Or is that just how Olivia wrote the script? 
So Maud Wood Park was the keynote speaker. Um, I would just like to mention about the archives just for one second, but it connects to this. Um, everything and like I'd say like 80% of what I took was direct quotes from newspaper articles that were written um, about the event and they spe all specifically noted that like the big draw of the suffrage event was that Maud Wood Park would be speaking and Maud Wood Park was a journalist and a suffrage speaker and, um, and a suffrage she would write pamphlets and uh, articles about women's suffrage and she was um, pretty well known in Massachusetts and um, in the country for her writings and speakings um, for women's suffrage. Um, and Paul can go into greater detail than I can, but. No. Maybe. She's like, maybe no. <laughs> <laughs> so was she, do we know if she was from Massachusetts um, resident or she was just a. Yeah, Came uh, in from Boston. She's from Boston. And the other ladies that were there, did they attend Smith with Blanche or they were just socialites that she knew from her circle? At the meeting? Yeah. Um, we're mostly people from Brockton, um, a few from Easton. Um, like there was one lady who was a librarian at, um, a librarian at the Northeastern Public Library. So it was m mostly local, people that Blanche knew locally. Or, um, so I would... Like I said, I have done very little research on each of these amazing individual women. I would highly doubt more than a few of them went to Smith College. Okay. And she also did her graduate work over at uh, Bridgewater. I think back then it was Bridgewater Normal School, but she did her graduate program there, which not too many people seem to either realize or know about. I found that accidentally, actually. <laughs> Do we know if Bridgewater has anything? Um... You know, I, when I discovered that, it was just as COVID hit and I wanted to try to do some research and haven't been able to. <laughs> okay. Most of Blanche's archives are at Smith College. You might find some um, with the Eastern Historical Society, um, but I would say about 95% of all of Blanche's papers or journals would be at Smith College. Yeah, makes sense. Other questions? Um, Uh, the comments. Evelyn. Yes, I would like to uh, say hi to Willie. I missed when he said it before. Hi to me. Um, <laughs> but, but Willie came and spoke at, at Bridgewater State um, for our One Book, One Community program when we did the book Freedom by Any Means. And um, he came as one of our event speakers and we learned so much um, that evening when he spoke and I also want to tell you Willie that we have the Underground Railroad quilt if the Bridgewater I mean um, Brockton Public Library would ever like to have it on display there for a while it's been on tour <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I can't speak for the library. I can kind of speak to that, but um, we'd have to reach out to Paul, but we don't plan on opening the building in a big way. Okay. For some time, maybe okay. possibly not for the rest of the year, but um, I can pass that along to Paul Engel. Okay, that's fine. It, it's there, it's been, it's toured um, all of the local libraries. In fact, right now it, it will be coming out of hostage holding at the East Bridgewater Library because <laughs> it's in lockdown too. It got stuck, <laughs> it got stuck there with COVID. <laughs> I can always reach out. I uh, I can let Paul know. Maybe um, Mr. Angle or myself could probably reach out to East Bridgewater. Okay. And see if they want to pass it along to us once it's been quarantined. Well, we can we can get it there. To the, that's what we do. <laughs> oh great. Okay. So yeah. yeah so if you want to reach out to Pat with it and Pat forward my email, forward it to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, speaking of displays, we have three incredible um, displays that um, are coming up. Actually, we have one now at the library, um, two, <laughs> we still don't know how the second one came, but that one is from Suffrage 100, Jen? The one I just set up? The one you just put up. 
That's from national, uh, the National Archives. Ah, that's from the National Archives. Okay, so we have um, one display up right now in the library. Um, and, you know, again, as Jen was just saying, there's very few people who are allowed in the library and it's by appointment and whatever, but that one is up there now. Um, we somehow got a second um, copy of that. And I believe that we're going to try to put it at um, Brockton City Hall. And then um, at some point in the next couple of months, we have a couple of the panels coming in from the Massachusetts archives um, on Massachusetts um, suffragists. And then in October, the American Bar Association, um, you know more about that display than I do, Jen. Uh, it's another display from America, and it has about six tall panels that we were originally going to display around our circulation floor because there's just so many of them. Um, we will have to finagle something in the building once they arrive, and they were gonna they were gonna travel between our three library locations and, and city hall. Um, we're hoping in the month we have it for a whole month. We got lucky that we were able to have it for a whole month in October. So. Um, Hopefully we'll be able to blast that more information on where that ends up getting set up along with the ones from the mass archives as well. Yeah, actually it looks like we'll have the um, American Bar Association uh, display for five weeks because if it's coming in on yep. September 23rd. He's shipping it out on the 21st of September. Yeah. We should be having it for the whole month of October. Yeah, so we'll have it for about five weeks. Um, if you, um, can you put the, um, if you don't mind, the uh, Facebook, link in there for people. Again? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, because our Facebook page has up-to-date information about what we're doing and um, what we're planning. And as I said at the very beginning, um, there's a lot of really great programs coming up from the Native American movie in two weeks on the 19th, the following week um, about um, cyber issues in voting uh, with uh, our own mayor, uh, Brockton Mayor Robert Sullivan, um, and several other people. Um, and then that doesn't stop right there. <laughs> we have several other things that are planned for September and October. And I think we're gonna be going into November um, as a result of the COVID. So when we, you know, the committee has to laugh because when we first started the process, we had come up with 42 different events. And we realized about a week and a half ago that we're, uh, with the COVID and doing a lot of things virtually, we're probably going to get closer to 50 events. So <laughs> that's good. I, I did have one thing I wanted to share with uh, Laura and Ezra. Uh, the uh, there were two other individuals who were involved in the uh, the suffragist movement, and one was Henry Brown Blackwell, who was an advocate for social and economic reform. He was one of the founders of the Republican Party and the American Suffrage Association. He published the Women's Journal starting in 1870 in Boston with Lucy Stone. And both Blackwell and Lucy Stone were actually visitors at what is now Frederick Douglass Avenue. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, High Street uh, at the time and where we had the uh, Liberty Tree. And so uh, as when you mentioned Emma Goldman and Ida B. Wells, so you know you want might want to that's another connection. So just remember that that Brockton was North Bridgewater at that time. But uh, but I again outstanding uh, outstanding job on that documentary and Olivia. Oh, everything is just good and it's just finally I know Professor James Keneally from Stonehill. His whole point was that Blanche Ames has not been given the credit that she deserves and. Uh, and uh, I think he is really, he should be just elated. I know he was involved with uh, the, the film and uh, I know he must be delayed with the results. I haven't spoken with him. Yeah, thank you. All right, so if we have nothing else final, um, you know, I can't thank enough. I, Olivia, I know you put your heart and soul into this. Um, that is absolutely incredible script writing for anyone at any age, let alone a high school senior at the time. Um, and you did do a phenomenal job directing that, I can tell you firsthand. Um, Laura, Ezra, um, absolutely phenomenal production. Yeah, um, we have one more. Okay. Me, go ahead. Uh, 
It's me again. It's Tomasita. <laughs> <That's so. okay. laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Willie, can I get your contact information? Can you send it to me? I, I did. I put it up on chat. Oh, okay. Let me look through it. I yeah. didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. not, I've, I've got your email and I can okay. um, um, make sure I get it to you. Um, okay, thank you. Paul, you've been so accommodating to this whole thing and so supportive um, and so engaging with every one of us um, that uh, it's just wonderful. And Catherine, what can we say about you? You're okay. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Thanks. She's a champ. She's a champ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much for uh, participating. Uh, please take the survey. Um, that would be really great. Um, and um, as I said, two weeks from now, we have the movie on the 19th about the Native American political situation. And then the following week, it's going to be really interesting to talk about uh, cybersecurity with uh, the mayor and other folks, too. So, and, and how do we get in touch with Ezra and Laura if we wish to? Well, we'll, we'll get in touch. All right. Good. I think I know your grandfather. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Pat. Thank Mahosa. you, David. Now you, you, you can see my dad. Can you, can you see his dad? Oh, oh right here. Hey. <laughs> do you see him? <laughs> the, the rabbi is here. <laughs> oh, oh, there he is too. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Rabbi Werb, how are you? <laughs> Well, it's funny because I saw him log on and it's like, I didn't make, put two and two together. And it's like, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it must be a relative. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this was a fantastic conversation as they all are. Um, it's uh, really, really great. And I'm very, very happy. Ah, there she is, the face behind the questions. Oh, yes. <laughs> Miss, Miss Austin. <laughs> well, Olivia, we might have a couple of connections for you to go visit people in Austin or in Texas. So, you know, if you uh, need to connect, <laughs> that might be great. Um, all right. Well, thank you again to uh, everybody so much. Really appreciated that. Um, you stuck with us through this whole thing. Um, Barbara, you were kind of quiet tonight. Um, <laughs> and a few others of you. Um, but again, thank you so much. And uh, hope to see you at one of our other future events. Thanks. Great job. Congratulations, thank you. Olivia. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye now. Take everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.